Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Luke chapter 19, verses 12. If you're there, you say, Amen. Luke chapter 19, verses 12. If you're there, you say, Amen. He therefore said, a certain noble man went into a distant country to obtain for himself a kingdom and then to return, calling ten of his own bond servants, bond servants, bond servants, okay? Bond servants. Somebody say bond servants. How many of you know the difference between a servant and a bond servant? Put up your hand if you know the difference. All right. I'll explain it for those of you who don't know. A servant is somebody who beyond their will to serve is taken under any circumstances to serve. In other words, they wish they were free, but they don't have the ability to be free, and therefore, because of any circumstances, whether it's poverty, whether it's it's by force, or whichever it is, they find themselves serving without choice. Are we together? That's a servant. Christianity is not supposed to have that kind of mentality in ministry. Are we together? The gospel is not supposed to be forced on you. Are we together? You're not supposed to be serving God like you're forced to serve Him. The essence of freedom is for us to serve. That is why when God was instructing Moses, He told him, tell Pharaoh to let my people go that they might what? Serve me. Let my people go. Let my people free that they might serve me. The place of service is freedom. Somebody say amen. So you're free in service. That's why I tell people service is for free men. If you're not serving God, you're not free. It doesn't matter how free you feel. You're not free. Somebody say amen. So there is a place of servanthood where somebody either is taken by force without their will into service or some, it's not by force, but it is the circumstances around them that force them to think that if I don't serve so and so, I will not leave. That's servanthood. That is a servant. That is not the mentality that Christ has called you and I to have. He doesn't force us, and we are not serving because we have problems. Somebody say amen. Some people think, ah, you serve, then the problems will go. That's not the mentality God has called us to. And that is why the Bible uses the word bond servant. Paul always introduced himself in the Amplified as a bond servant of God. I, Paul, which is a bond servant. And let me explain what a bond servant is. In the Jewish culture, back in those days, there was a time where servants would serve, and some had a time frame of service. And at the end of that time frame of service, they were free to go. But some of them, because they served under a housemaster who was very generous and loving and cautious and caring and and, and giving and and there for them, they fell in love with their master. And so at the point when they were supposed to be free, in fact freed, many of them changed their mind and say, even though I go, I still feel an attachment to this man. I would rather go and serve him by choice because he treated me well. That's a bond servant. Bond servant is a man which is free though makes himself a servant by choice because he has a relationship with a master, with a past experience that makes them feel that they would rather serve this man than go establish their own freedom elsewhere. That's salvation. We are servants by choice. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's for liberty that Christ died. Praise the Lord. Christ died for our freedom. That is why he tells them now ye are no longer servants, but now ye are Come on, what does the Bible say? You are what? Friends. The one time I found a guy screaming, I'm not a servant, I'm a son. And then I understand that. But you see, unless you want to say Paul was stupid to say he was a born servant, 
But when you understand the concept, it means to say we are not serving because we are we have the other mentality, but we are serving because we know we are free, and by choice in love we choose to serve. Somebody say amen. So that's why Paul says, I, Paul, a bond servant. He says, a bond servant of Jesus Christ the Messiah, called to be an apostle, a special messenger, set apart to preach the gospel, the good news of and from God. That's how he introduces himself, a bond servant. Now let's go back to the story. He says, calling of his own bond servants, he gave them, sorry, he gave them ten minus, each equal to about 100 days wages or nearly 20 Dollars and said unto them, Buy and sell with this while I go, then I will return. Are we together? But his citizens detested him and sent an embassy after him to say, We do not want this man to become ruler over us. When he returned after having received the kingdom, he ordered these bond servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much each one had made by buying and selling. He left them with money. Are we together? He left them with? Money, or probably let me read that part for you in the message, then we come back in the Amplified. He says, He called the 10,000 servants, verses 13, together, gave them each a sum of money, and instructed them, Operate with this until I return. But the citizens hated him, so they sent a commission with a signed petition to oppose his rule. He says, We don't want this man to rule us. When he came back bringing the authorization of his rule, he called those 10 servants to whom he had given the money to find out how they had done. The first said, Master, I doubled your money. He said, Good servant, great work. Because you've been trustworthy in this small job, I'm making you governor over ten towns. The second master said, Master, I made 50% profit on your money. He said, I'm putting you in charge of five towns. I see. The next servant said, Master, there is your money safe and sound. I kept it hidden in the cellar. To tell you the truth, I was a little afraid. I know you have high standards and hate sloppiness and don't suffer fools gladly. He said, you're right that I don't suffer fools gladly. Jesus didn't deny that. He can't suffer fools gladly. He doesn't entertain fools in the gospel. Praise God. Shabbat performances. And every man of God should be so with their ministry. We don't play in the gospel. If you're putting the lights, put them up. If you're wiring the machines, wire them. If you're not wiring, tell us. We'll get somebody else to wire. If you're ushering, usher. You're not doing people a favor. You're serving God. Are we together? Apostle Grace, if you're preaching, preach. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus doesn't take what? Fools gladly. Now the Bible says, 23, Why didn't you at least invest the money in securities? Or so that I would have gotten a little interest on it. Then he said to those standing there, Take the money from him and give it to the servant who doubled my stake. And he said, They said, But master, he already has double. <laughs> People are funny. And the Bible then says, Yeah, that's what I mean. Risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe and end up holding the bag. Read it again. Risk your life and get more than you have ever dreamed of. Play it safe. And end up holding a bag. Risk your life and get more than you've ever dreamed of. Play it safe and end up holding the bag. Play it safe. You be just a lukewarm guy who just comes to pray every Sunday. Just play it safe. Don't, risk, don't be among the ones they are pelting stones at. Don't be among those ones they are abusing on the streets preaching. You play it safe. Sit in your office and just relax as I love but Nero. <laughs> You'll hold the bag. <laughs> Give me the, the amplified of that. <laughs> you said, I tell you that everyone who gets and has will more be given. Read again. I tell you that everyone who gets and has will more be given. But from the man who does not get and does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Mugamba <laughs> mina. To whom much is given, much is what? Required. When God says that I'm giving you, let me show you something in Luke. Let's read in Luke. Again. Chapter 12, I want to read for you something. 
The Bible says 47, 48. 12, 47, 48. This scripture reminds me of a certain story I'm going to tell you. But don't laugh at me. There was a servant. He says, and the servant which, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself. Are you hearing me? The servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. Unto whom men have committed much, of him they will ask more. Are we together? Are we together? Can we read it again? He says, For unto whomsoever much is given, he says, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask more. Read the message of that. Verse 48. He says, begin from verse 47. It says, the servant who knows what his master wants and ignores it, or insolently does whatever he pleases, will be thoroughly thrashed. But he, if he does a poor job through ignorance, he will get up with a slap on the hand. Great gifts mean great responsibilities. Greater gifts, greater responsibilities. To whom much is given, much is required. Many years ago, now I'm starting with my story. It's a family story. Don't laugh. Many years ago, I have a brother I follow. He's called Pastor Tessa Ronat of the Remnant Ministries International. <laughs> uh, he's my elder brother. He's a man of God. Now, I used to follow him a lot. I remember even one time he stoned me for following him. <laughs> you know, when, when you're growing up, there is a certain sibling you attach to. You fight with a lot, but you love most. Are we together? That's the thing about brothers. They can hate each other, but you touch the brother. That's when you know that. Uh, that's how they love each other. You understand? More so when you're from Africa. It's even deeper. So, <laughs> we used to be close. Now, younger, we fight most, you know. But every time I would fight, my father would blame me. But I understood later that you're supposed to, re- to respect your elder. You understand? Whether they are wrong, you're wrong if you fight them if you're younger. That's how I know it, okay? It might not subscribe to you, but that's how I know it. So we used to go, we used to walk together a lot. And they used to beat us together. They used to beat us together. Many times we, they used to beat us together. But there's a story I have. I don't know that money remembers. One time, we used to have a certain company just about 150 meters from my home. They used to have huge white lights that were brighter than these lights. Huh? Very white lights. Very white. And so, during that time, of course, Uganda was a bit darker than it is now. So, a few lights like that existed in the nation. So, during that time... It was a season for grasshoppers. I don't know whether people poison them these days. I don't see grasshoppers like I used to see them. Because I remember we would wake up and grasshoppers are on the home tree, they're on the grass, they're everywhere. You're just speaking. Do you remember? What happened to them? Do you remember, you guys? Do you remember the days of grasshoppers? They used to be everywhere. You just speak like this. If, if you have, you know, grass, anything green, eh? Those of you come from the village, they would go into those... those, uh, those Heaps of, of sweet potato, whatever. Then they, they are there, they are more, be, you know. Some of us are from town, don't know. So, <laughs> so, so the, there was always grasshoppers. Who remembers those days? Yeah, the 90s don't remember. And some of us were a bit older. <laughs> Praise God. Me and Apostle Emma remember. So we used to pick grasshoppers. So one of those days, we went down. The light was brighter than that. So went down and there was a bunch of kids and they were all picking grasshoppers. Now, I used to fear grasshoppers. Because me, I always had this feeling. Okay, in my head, they would bite me before I touch them. I don't know how that math used to work. But I would feel like it's biting me before I even what? Handle it. So I used to fear them. But I over... In fact, the first time I, I ate a grasshopper, mommy remembers that story. When they used to fry them, me, I used to fear them because I used to think they are looking at me. I used to say, you know, everyone who dies, their eyes closed. But this creature... Even when you fry it, it still looks like it says, touch me, I will show you. <laughs> Mommy knows the story. I will show you fire. So I feared, so at first I used to tell her, remove the heads. 
I was very little. I removed the head. Then I removed the head. I ate. So the first time I ate a grasshopper with a head, I remember even. I ate so fast that it doesn't grasshopper. <laughs> I'm teaching, by the way. So, but I learned to catch them slowly by slowly. They have, you know, very funny, small little thorns on their feet and... You know, now our kids are even worried for them. They can't even hand a grasshopper. My nieces, they eat them in small foil papers. They don't know the glory. So, <laughs> so I remember, we, what? We, we went to pick, and I used to fear. So I, I caught a few, you know, because it was there. But this guy, I used to pick and put in. So we went with bottles. You remember those bottles? You put grasshoppers, you cover. <laughs> and the grasshopper starts to skip. You cover. So he got many. He got many. Me, I got like over eight, over nine. <laughs> so we reached home. Daddy had come back early. Mr. Matov Paolo, he had come back early. He asked us, where are you coming from? He said, we're from catching grasshoppers. He told me, don't I feed you? <laughs> are you telling the neighbors that I'm too poor? <laughs> Not to feed you? We knew we were in trouble. He told somebody, go bring my stick. I told my younger sister. He said, now everyone, the number of grasshoppers you have. <laughs> I looked at my grasshoppers. I looked at Mutuja and said, this guy is in trouble. Mama, mama, mama. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He had more I said, Brother, you're dead. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> to whom much is given. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. They shall be beaten with. Say. <laughs> I, every time I see that scripture, I remember that experience of much stripes and few stripes. He that knew not did not commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten few. <laughs> ah, we bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now back to the point. The point is that um, it's easy when a man goes to God and tells him, I want a gift. Father, I want a gift to heal. I want a gift to prophesy. I want a gift to cast out devils. I want a gift to demonstrate power. I want a gift to make money. I want a gift. And they ask and say, God, I want a gift. But every gift comes with responsibilities. To whom much is given. He says, and to whom men commit to The Bible says, when they commit to you, they desire too much. Hallelujah. And there comes a point where your level of understanding the price of that gift on your life, in spite of the grace on your life, without the understanding, could put you in a place where you start to carry frustrations later of the very things you asked for because you did not carry the tenacity for the gift. Praise God. Moses loved God. Moses sought God. Moses had a zeal to change the children of Israel. His heart's desire was there that one time Israel would be saved. And he went to God desperately to see change. To see that the children of Israel come out of bondage. Hallelujah. But Israel was not 20 men. Israel was a nation. The consequence of dealing with a nation is different from the consequence of dealing with 12 people. Are we together? Are we together? Of 13 people. It was a price. Hallelujah. And it's out of that that he becomes a bit indifferent because the demand on his life sometimes cannot weigh with the wisdom necessary to make sure that at every point of his walk with God, there is a reconciliation between what is expected of him and what is given to him. You see Moses looking at an Egyptian, beating up an Israelite. Before God even empowers him with the right tools, he takes it to his mind with that zeal. And then he gets a man 
and then puts him in the, in the sand and kills him. When a man does that kind of thing, there will always be somebody who sees. That is why later, when he comes later to approach a certain guy, he says, No, it's not thou that we saw thee killing a man. You want to kill us like you killed a man in the, gra- in the, in the sand too? Moses did not know that somebody saw him. Are we together? And that sparked another war. That sparked another war with the house of Pharaoh. Moses flees from Egypt and goes 40 years to become a slave. And God never spoke to Moses one day. One day. Because he had an anger issue. Are we together? Because he had an anger issue. The zeal to save the nation was there. But the anger on his spirit could not... I don't know who I'm speaking to. The zeal to save the nation was there. But there was a character in him that could not sustain what he was asking for. You're dealing with a nation. No, not dealing with two people. Two people can piss you off. I've seen parents who deal with only two children. And I say, how do you do it? There are people here. They have one child. But that child, one, one like this. Don't touch the remote. The moment they don't pull them. Now you boy, they put him up. They, now <laughs> you're dealing with a nation. You're dealing with a nation. You're dealing with a nation. Somebody one time was criticizing a certain leader of a certain nation, not Uganda, and he was criticizing that leader in a very unbalanced understanding of the things of God. I told him, look. This man is not a leader for Christians. He's a leader for the whole nation. Like he is a God both for the Jew, the Gentile, the heathen, and the believer. Because the believer has been good and God giveth him rain, it don't mean that he will refuse to give the atheist rain because you have an issue with the atheist. The Bible says he giveth food and rain to both the believers and the atheists, the unbelievers, the heathen. He gives them food too. He blesses them too. That is God. That is God. Are you hearing me? Of course he wants them to change in one way or another. But there is a bigger picture when God trusts you with many. There is a certain character God expects you to have when you are dealing with many. Now, leave me to pastor, it's people. You, it's business, much money. You, it's, 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 it's career. You know, much responsibility, the promotions that you're going to have as you grow up. God is going to promote you. Because the Bible says promotions come from neither east nor from the west, but they come from God. When God promotes you from one level to another level, that comes with certain responsibilities. Your job description changes. Are we together? And the expectation in between of what job description might not define, but it's the expectation of every man which goes up in the things of the Spirit, is judgment. That is key. You learn to judge issues. 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 Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. You learn to judge issues. The right way. So Moses is trusted with people. And the next thing we know, even just the demand to eat almost killed him. The scriptures are clear. He told God that if you don't stop this, I'm going to die. Why? He was feeding hundreds of thousands of people. He knew he was going to die. Until God had to get 70 men full of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, and I shall put in them your spirit. That is why I tell ministers. The first thing that God does when he gives you men, he gives them your kind of spirit. It doesn't matter how gifted the man is if he doesn't carry your spirit. He's not yours. He has another man's spirit. Let him go to that man. Praise God. Praise God. Let him go to that man. He said, I shall fill them with your Holy Spirit. I will take the Spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them. That's what the Spirit says. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. In other words, your, your burden becomes lighter. Because the heart in you to reach out starts to sit on their heart to reach out to. That's the essence 
of men which belong to you, they make your burden lighter. Period. Even in business, when you're working with men, men who are of your spirit must make your burden lighter. They, you must reach office, and a man by proactiveness has done what you expected them to do as you would have done it. Not as they should have done it, but as you would have done it. I don't know whether you understand what I mean. Are we together? That is why it's general knowledge. If you want to grow anywhere, in any rank. Me, I grew fast in the bank. My fellow bankers can tell you that I understood my master. And I served him exactly that way. It was those small things. There were times I would know that he wants to run for a deal at 6.30. And he has the bank keys and I tell him, Sebo. And I have free. I'm free a bit for an hour. And I tell him, Sebo, give me the keys. Go and run for that deal. Ah, this guy understands. You see what I'm trying to tell you? At that point, everyone was running out of the bank because they are too late. But that one extra hour to make his burden lighter is what makes you the star. Somebody say amen. It's what makes you the star. It's what makes you different. Always know your master before you serve them. Don't just serve them. Know them. Understand how they think. That when they look at you, you make their work easy. You don't complicate it. There are people you can work with. By the time you find that they've spoiled everything, you have to recollect everything back. You understand? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just about good service. It's about the spirit upon the man serving. Somebody say amen. amen. But you see, he says he, he was too overwhelmed that he almost died. Praise God. But you see, let's go back to the issue of the anger. He cut a wire, you know. He says, how can this Egyptian kill my person? The zeal was true. It was right, but it was done the wrong way. What happened? God did not speak to Moses for 40 years. 40 years. Was the call on his life there? Yes. The method was wrong, but the heart was right. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. The method was wrong, but the heart was right. The heart was right. He wanted to redeem Israel from the hand of Pharaoh. How together? And that same demon follows him through. To whom may much is given, much is required. They start to come to him panting and telling him, we want water, we want water, we want water, we want water. Why are they coming? Because you are given (laughs) much. Moses, don't cut a wire. You were given much, you asked for it. We want water, we want water. Why? Because you have it, you have a way. It was given to you to give the way. But you see, take heed. When you get too tired of the demands on men, which carry an expectation from you, because it is affirmed by God that it was given to you. You be careful. You be careful. You be careful. You be careful. (laughs) Because out of that anger, Moses goes on the rock. Three times. And they get the water they want, and God disqualifies him there. He tells him, this is the farthest you can go. This spirit can't enter the promise. This spirit can't move in promise. It cannot move from the promise. Why? Because as much as... Listen, God's original plan was for Moses to lead the children of Israel to the promised land. His original plan was not for him to die in the wilderness. No. God's original plan was for Moses to take the children of Israel up to... The promised land. But something on him could not have the right character and spirit and tenacity to hold on to and carry the rest and comfort that he had to have as a man for him to cross. And what happened? God immediately tells him, look, you can see, but you can't go. And there his body was up there. And the devil loves such ministers. The devil loves such ministers. (laughs) <laughs> because he can replicate himself. That's why there is no man written of in the scripture for whom the devil fought the body with. Body. Imagine. The Bible says that the devil started contending with angels over Moses' body because he needed that body. He didn't care if the guy was gone. 
he needed Moses' body. He knew what he wanted to do with it. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. So be careful when you're angry because there's too much demand on you. Somebody say amen. A few days ago, somebody came to me and told me, Apostle, so and so annoyed me and, 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 and did this to me. You understand? Then I called the so and so who annoyed them. I told them, why did you annoy and do this to this person? They said, I did it because she did this and this and this and this to me. Apostle, you see, you judge the matter. This person did this to me, that's why I did it. And I told them, look, you're the wrong one. I said, why? Because the position you hold had to understand that I did not give you that position because nobody could do it. But I gave you that position because I trusted that you have enough maturity to deal with issues when this one is funny. Am I making a point here? Any job, in, there's no job in this world nobody cannot do. Even where you are, God can replace you. Let me tell you, there is no office in this world that no man cannot do. No man in this world is invisible. Any man can be replaced. Even Jesus died and went to heaven and left the twelve. Praise God. But that office requires a certain responsibility. Judgment. Are we together? Because they left you in a particular office, if, if a kid abuses you, that kid abuses you because they don't have an office. You have it. Now, you can also be consumed in that and also go down and de- 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 understand, do your fights below and tell us that you're a child. Or you can up your game and say, look, because of the position I hold, I'm not going to do this. Do you think you have to talk back because they talked about you? That's how Christians are. Even in your funny uh, organizations where you work, you think you must fight also from here because you, you understand. Even me, now I'm going to show that person what I'm really made of and I'm making her. Really. To whom much is given, <laughs> much is required. Not like much power to kill. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as you grow in God, you realize that the responsibilities He sets on your life come with too much expectation. They come with too much expectation. At that particular point, whether you want it or not, it doesn't matter whether Eve ate it, Adam, you're responsible. You can't come and tell me, oh, the marriage is failing. Now, first look at the man. No, the woman is quite some years, but man of God. <laughs> There's a reason why when Eve ate, God said nothing. The answer is with you. You eat, God comes. Adam, what have you done? <laughs> Eve eats nothing. Because you're the head. Because you're the head, there are things that I'm responsible for. We can both do the same things and I get in trouble. You can lie and you're okay. And Apostle Grace lies. Ay, 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 Fanero pasta lies. <laughs> Why? Why? Because I'm a minister. You understand? So the stakes are higher for me. I'm not supposed to even chew chocolate. It can come out a certain mystery. <laughs> Yet for you can chew your chocolate and bulge and nobody cares. They say, oh my, eat. You're not under the law. You just eat. <laughs> come and substitute chocolate for something else. Are we together? So my point here is, that's why when the devil is attacking, he comes to the shepherd. He didn't waste his time with the sheep. Boom! Hit the sheep, shepherd. And the Bible says there, shepherd, the sheep what? Scatter. Because you have hit where it hurts most. So there are even certain things that will come to you, not because you're a wrong person, no, but because you're in an office. Spiritually, you're in an office. That is why I was warning a certain uh, Christian, I think one time I mentioned it, a certain Christian was screaming against a certain man of God, that man is this, that man is that, and they were attacking a certain minister, okay? They were attacking a certain minister. <laughs> and I called the person, I told him, look, when, if you should point a hand or your finger on Elijah, because he's pursued by Jezebel, 
because he killed more than 400 Baal prophets. <laughs> and you think that the 7,000 which are hid are better than him because they've, they are not being chased by Jezebel, then you have lost the picture. They played it safe. And today in the church we are preaching the gospel the other way around. We are giving glory to 7,000 hidden men. So it's okay to be hid as a prophet than to be chased after by Jezebel because you're killing mobile prophets. And I don't understand how Christians reconcile that. And sometimes there are men and women in this world who are being chased after by all sorts of things because they killed more than 400 Baal prophets a few days ago. And you look at them and think that they are bad people, they are the worst people. How could they, yet they are under that attack because they are on the front line of the war. You're in the back end. You're enjoying, you're so hid from any arrow or bullet to hit you. And you think that you're more glorious because the man is suffering in front. Oh... Continue playing itself. That's why none of those 7,000 is written about. He didn't write a story. God doesn't write stories with such men. So I said, there were 7,000 which were hid of God. And God can hide you. And you see, it's okay to hide you. There's a, there's a true hiding. But we're not hidden from the gospel. No, this is what I believe by hiding. It is when the devil sends his cohorts to attack me now. And then he hears my voice, but he can't see me. That's called hiding. But if I should be taken off this pulpit and I can't minister, that's not hiding. That's bondage. Are we together? God had to get one guy, Elisha. 6,999 stayed hid. You always find them on the straight lines. Do you know that the Lord taketh your master? And see how God deals with them. God deals with them in a way, in, in a very funny way. The highest level of their vision is God is taking Elijah. That's the highest level of their vision. That's the highest level of their vision. God is taking Elijah. Know it's not that the Lord taketh your master. And Elisha says, I know. But that's the farthest they know. And they die that way. They can know that God is taking Elijah. Elijah, sorry. But that's it. They don't know that what God is taking is the chariots and the armies of Israel. Their eyes were not open to the highest line of responsibility. Maybe they did not even admire Elisha, Elijah. Maybe they even sat in the back and judged him and said, No, that guy is, is not spiritual enough. How can Jezebel look after you? For us, now we are not seen. You see, there is a glory that hides us. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. I'm, 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 I'm am I communicating, saints? See, if a man, a man who is in the 7,000 can look back and say, eh, he can even preach a sermon and say, God hid us. We did not bow to bow, but God what? Hid us. And the glory there is that I was hid in the time when Jezebel looked for men to, to kill, yet I did not bow to bow. You understand? But the day... You ever go out and risk and say that the God which answereth by fire is God. You don't know what it means for... Elijah's faith was not just God bringing out fire. Elijah's faith was that no demon God that day could produce anything that looks like fire. He was holding two hours at a go. Listen... If you look at the end time prophecies, Jesus says that some shall even call fire from heaven, but they shall be in the wrong spirit. Isn't it? That means that from ancient history, it is the truth, infallible, that there are men which could call upon fire, even without the true spirit of God. But that day, Elijah had an authority to stop any spirit to make fire and believe God to make fire. He even has the ability of faith to scorn at them and tell them, uh-uh, scream a bit louder. Catch yourself. Perhaps the guy is not hearing. Why? Because at that particular point he knew that whether they want it or not, no fire can come out. 
And to show them that he was dealing with God, not just man or any, any natural element. He told them, first pour water. First that when it comes, you know it was not by power, not by might, it was by my spirit, said the Lord. First that when it comes, you know that it was not this guy. There was something on that man that was different. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what caught their attention. Of Jezebel. What business did she have with 7,000 guys who can't even believe? Are we together? Now today, many Christians and saints I hear put too much folly on Elijah and say, Elijah, how could he not know? He thought that he was the only one. And, and that's what they make a center of their contention and lesson for men, as though they're implying that it would have added anything for Elijah to know that there were 7,000 men. It would not have changed nothing. There was still a spirit in that man that needed to challenge status quo. Somebody say amen. amen. So, I told the person, I cannot judge a man who has killed 400 demons if they are chased after by Jezebel, then a man whom Jezebel hasn't chased because Jezebel has no reason to chase. <laughs> Just has no reason. You're not a threat. Some of you are not a threat to the devil. That's why you're not under attacks. Simple. You're just not a threat. You've never had street children being abducted. But they took a street child and, and sacrificed her. No, they come for those ones in homes whom they put sleeping jelly on. <laughs> that stuff, I don't know why, but it used to make me sleep. Sleeping baby. I don't know if I had curry for me. But am I making sense? Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody say, I have to function. Say it with your spirit and say, I have to function. Why? Because there is enough grace to keep Elijah through. And he made it. Jezebel died. Elijah didn't die. But see, how people see, God is taking your master. That's the farthest they could go. Why? Because they never stepped in the arena of responsibility. They don't know what it means to carry a mantle for a nation. They don't know what it means to carry a mantle for a university, for a city, for a country, for a continent. That one act by Moses disqualified him as leader of Israel. One act. Those are the testations I'm talking about. The process of calling and election. Many fall in that calling because the de- de- gifts are very deceptive. Those gifts make men think that they are in the elect. Listen, many are called. You're called to be a pastor, a preacher, an apostle a worshiper, whatever you're called to be. But man, the election is different. That's why there's that protection on the elect. Who shall lay charge on the Lord's elect? Not the called. And that process of calling has many things and testations that take place. But there's that character that is necessary to be reconciled with when God has to trust you with too much. He has to trust you with too much. He has to trust you with too much. He has to trust you with too much. A man goes to Lystra, preaches the gospel, he's beaten to pulp until he's almost dead. They throw him out of the city, left him for dead. The next day he washes off, I mean, his blood, and the next day he's going to Derby to preach the very thing that got him beaten in Lystra. You're still dealing with a Christian who says, More of you. I'm sorry, I'm not going to pray, I have a headache. More of you. I'm sorry, Apostle, I couldn't attend, I had a stomachache. More of you. I'm not coming, that brother talked about me. Jesus, more of you. Listen. More of you. She annoyed me. I'm not going to. You, 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 you're getting your small little feud that you had with your sister in red, and you think, and you're getting that, and you're killing the responsibility of the anointing and demand on your life because you have an issue with her. Oh, why did God anoint you? Why did God anoint you? Why did God anoint you? 
You get to work and see. Many professionals are like that. I'm not going to post this. <laughs> it's because every day he's the one who is supposed to post it. But now that he has annoyed me, let him do his JD and let me also do my JD. Mm-hmm. Listen. <laughs> Listen. The Lord will pause you. The Lord will pause you. <laughs> the Lord will pause you. You're going to say, I've been in this position for 10 years. Why? Because you don't have the character. Even if they annoyed you, do the report the next day. Even if it's in their JD to do, if you had deliberated to do it, let not what your mind is that has made up to do, refuse to do because you have an issue with them. Let them deal with their God. You have a calling way bigger. You have a responsibility way bigger. Than this. That's when you understand a man who has understood love. True love. Two women are fighting in front of the man of wisdom, and one carries a baby. She stole the other baby, put her in her bed, and then got hers and put it in the other bed, right? Isn't it? Isn't it? And then this woman comes and says, This one has taken my child. And then they go before the man of wisdom. There is enough proof that the woman with the baby is the mother. How did I steal it? It's mine. And the man of wisdom realizes whoever touches more love to this entity owns it. He said, Cut the kid asunder. And the mother says, Instead of losing my child, because I can't have it. They would rather have it than losing it. That's love. It was the only way you could know that this child belonged to this woman. Because when true love hits your spirit, sometimes you learn to forego, even choose to lose certain things for the testimony of other things that are bigger than your personal pursuit. That's called maturity. Even as ministers of the gospel, there are things you learn to let go because they are the only reason you will love God the right way. Some of it is words. You don't need to speak back. Why? You love God. You love God. You don't need to be right all the time. You don't need to put up a spirited fight all the time. You're dealing with God. Now if you have to lose that battle and be wrong for the sake of the gospel, that's called promotion. That's called promotion. But many people lose it right there. They don't, that's why when a man wrongs, the Bible says, I mean even in normal language, they say take responsibility of it. You understand? So, even in the gospel or any other aspect, sometimes we take responsibility of things, not because we are the wrong ones, but because it's the right thing to do. Me, I have to, I have to, you know, I have to, you understand? And sometimes you end up right, but not true. There's a reason why Christ reviled not back. There's a reason why he reviled not back. Are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you learning something, child of God? Are you learning something? The things that sometimes make us... That's why I told you the other time about Paul. He said, some preach the gospel in contention and strife. Some know that with me out of the way, they will make it further because they look at me as their competition. He says, but he says, but what am I indeed to do? He says, the message. Uh-huh. How am I to respond? He says, I've decided that really I don't care about their what? Their motives. That's what Paul says. Whether mixed, bad, or indifferent. Are you seeing? I don't care whether somebody's indifferent in my ministry, whether they have a wrong motive in my ministry, whether they have this in my ministry, all that. No. He says, every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed, I cheer them on, and I'm going to keep on doing that. Why? In the next verse says, because I know how it's going to turn out, that through your faithful prayers and generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything, listen, he wants to do in and through me will be done. If, listen, 
if God, if, if, if I know that I'm having an issue with you is going to cause God not to do what He wants to do in me and through me, I would rather then have peace with you that God will do what He must do through me. But if I must have it with you to make sure that I settle scores, it only means I don't love God enough. I don't give a damn about God enough. But if I give a damn about God enough, about God, if I give a damn about God enough, I must make sure that I make peace with you and still maintain what God has placed in my life. Because listen, my misunderstanding with you cannot be compared with a lame man walking. If you've ever seen somebody coming out of a wheelchair, eh? in Kabale, some of you were there when they brought a woman who couldn't walk. The glory of a woman for the first time getting off that bed and walking. And you see her limbs strengthen. And she tells you that I came with swellings and there were like tumors and they disappeared. And she tells you I feel no pain. That glory cannot be substituted with an issue with you. It can't. It is way bigger. Because that's what goes on the cameras. But if I don't love God enough, I would rather pursue you and make sure I equal my deal with you. To whom much is given. Much is required. Men who do those things don't know how much is given to them. Period. If a person does that, they don't know how much is given to them. Sometimes you restrain because you carry the faith that God has trusted you with too much. Somebody say amen. Okay, let me read you one more scripture. Because many of you are married, you need to go home. That's how it happens. You don't believe it, I ain't come. First Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2. It says, moreover, read, one, two, three, let's go. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's the requirement. Regardless of anything, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful to what? To the call. Of course, anything else can be funny, but be faithful to the call. Why? Because that's the essence. It's like one time I was sharing with somebody about wisdom in Proverbs 24, I think. Let me read for you some Proverbs 24, 13. He says, the Bible speaks of wisdom. Eh? And he says, my son, eat thou honey because it is good. And that thy honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. And he says, so shall the knowledge of wisdom, when you know wisdom, be unto thy soul. That when thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward. And thy expectation shall not be cut short. When a man finds wisdom, you get a reward. Are you hearing me? And your expectation cannot be cut short. In other words, when wisdom comes to your spirit, nothing you expect can't happen. Nothing. There's a reward for a man acquiring wisdom. These things where you come every Thursday and hear the word, there's something you're putting in your spirit. There's a reward for it. And there's an increase of expectation in your spirit. It's always coming. Every time you sit under the truth, it multiplies in the inside of you. And where multiplication, there's a reward. Right now, you're investing minutes and hours in the presence of God. There's a reward for you. You're not coming for nothing. There's a reward for you. Every time you receive wisdom, there's a reward for you. What I've given you, you can't pay me. Because it can't be translated in currency. Are you with me? But that reward and expectation not being cut short, positions you in a place where God expects too much. Anyway, this is what I, I want to conclude with. Where we are at as a ministry, many of you have been fed with too much not to deliver. So every day you say, God, I'm receiving. Take the back end of that line and understand there is an expectation from you to deliver a certain way because you know too much. Many of you in this room know way too much than the churches and saints have seen in China and Hong Kong. You know way too much than men who have pastored churches in China and Hong Kong for more than 30 years. I sat with those men. I hear what they know about the gospel. And it's too painful. How then can I not have more to give? How then can I not have more? And the Bible says, and a man which is not faithful. Let me tell you, do you know that some men are functioning? quicker because certain men refuse to be responsible over what God gave them. 
and God gets it from a guy and he says, look, remain with your gift. Let me put the assignment on this guy. If I must give him another gift too, because my giftings are without repentance. If I must give him this gift too, I will give it to him. And I'll use him. Why? Because his heart is for divine purpose. Some people, let me tell you, don't have the tools to do the needs, but they have the right heart. And God uses them mightily. Catherine Kuhlman said she was always told that she's God's handmaid. A certain man refused it. And she asked for it. The list is endless. Reinhard Bonke. John Bouvier gives a story of a man whom God took to a certain place and told him build a church here. He gave him a picture. And then he drew it on a piece of paper. The exact picture of that church. And then he laughs and gave up and went to other places. He got another business deal and went far, far away. And then years later, the Lord somehow led him back to that city he was driving through. And then he remembers the church he drew on a piece of paper. And while he was parking, he saw the exact building on a certain road. He went into that building the Sunday, the next Sunday. And he sits in the back and weeps and weeps and weeps. And the pastor comes to him and asks him, why are you weeping? In the story, John Bouvier says that he removes a small piece of paper out of the back of his pocket and shows him and told him, God showed me this church many years ago. And I refused to do it. Simple. If you refuse, God will raise another. Because the need of heaven is way bigger. Many of you don't know how much has been given you. You know too much. You've received too much. Not to be responsible in the gospel. Many of you in the churches where you go to, in the fellowships where you're at, you're irresponsible. Why? Because you don't have any responsibility except prayer requests. Man of God, pray for me. My visa. Man of God, pray for me. My man. My man. Man of God, pray for me. My man. You understand? We can pray for you and God can sort that. But only to make you free to serve. We must raise a generation. However old you are, get something and do it so well for God. Just do it so well for God. You're going to be surprised how much anointing is going to follow that. There is an anointing that comes with men who serve. There is an anointing that comes with men who serve. So, when I see people excited, oh, I want a gift. One time a kid came to me and told me, Apostle Grace, I want a double portion of your anointing. <laughs> Even me, I laughed. I asked the kid, what are you going to use it for? I want to serve God. I asked them, do you know what you're asking for? Do you know what you're asking for? You're asking for the anointing. They want a product without the process. And they just want to wake up and then you say, Washala. Then we say, Papa. How much do you know? How much responsibility have you taken because of how much you know? And what you're asking for. Are you ready to take responsibility and the required judgment and maturity to sustain it because you're asking for it? Because I've seen many men destroyed because they didn't know how to handle what they received. Let me tell you. People just don't build ministries. People just don't get married. People just don't do business. People just don't get jobs. If you don't understand those underlying principles, that's why many of you, if somebody came to and said, I have prayed to God for five years to get a job and I failed to get a job. There's a reason. You don't have a demon on you. You don't have a demon on you. Understand the principles that make you so. At my first job, I was 12 years old. I just finished primary seven. And I worked for free. For three months. And the woman who hired me for those three months for free gave me my first job at campus, after campus. Volunteer. Volunteer. Do something for somebody. Okay, I know you don't have a job, but you have hands and legs. Do something for the gospel. 
You can't be without a job and you're coming at 7 p.m. to Fanero. Come and clean chairs and tell him, God, I don't have a job, but I can put chairs in line. Why? Because I know bankers who come earlier to put chairs in order. Why are you the unemployed brother? You're coming at 7 to find a clean chair and you're believing God for a job. Come on, speak another time. Just tell God to make you. I can't, I don't have any other advice. Even me, I have my own part. I'm going to pray for myself. But tell God to what? To make you. Tell God, fix me. Fix me. Tell Him, Lord, fix me. there's a place in you that could not carry the responsibility of those things. But I've prayed for you today. There's a grace now that gives you responsibility. God is empowering you right now. Start to receive it. Start to receive it. Tell him, God, I receive the divine ability of responsibility. Tell him I mean I receive the divine ability of the responsibility. Tell him I receive the divine ability of the responsibility for the things you're calling me to do. Tell God I need those gifts, but I need the divine ability. I need the tenacity. I need the character. I need the heart to sustain where you're taking me. In Jesus' mighty name, receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Listen, some of you, I've seen about seven people. The evangelists. I see you're going to move nations. You're going to stand before multitudes. By the numbers. By the thousands. But there's a character. There's a form. God is putting in you. be proud. You will not be indifferent. You will not abuse it. You will not take it for granted. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. For God is with you. I see gifts. Come
done enough in this place. What eye has not seen? What ear has not heard? What has not entered the hearts of men? Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Say it is mine. It is mine. Receive it with your heart. I receive it too. I receive it too. I receive the word too. I receive correction too. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I want to give my life to Christ today. I've been playing in the gospel. I'm tired. Come, put up your hand right now, wherever you are. Come, I see the hand. Come, darling. Say, I'm tired. Come, I see another hand. Say, I want to give my life to Christ. Oh, if somebody puts up their hand, you come. Come, where are they? Say, I need Jesus today. Walk slowly and come here. Jesus, from today, I believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Savior and Lord of my life. From today henceforth, say Amen. Amen. Did you did confess, you told me the, the three of you. You repeat with me, say Lord Jesus. I believe in my heart. That you died and rose again. That you're the true Son of God who takes away sin from today. I believe with my heart, confess with my mouth, that you're Savior and Lord of my life. Amen. If you've made that prayer, we're just going to take your names. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for these ones. Listen, I tell you as a man of God, your lives from today. I'm going to change. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Because you're changing their lives. You're changing their story. You're changing their destiny. You're changing their course. You're changing their thoughts. You're changing their patterns. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. See you next week. Oh, let's bless the offering. Father, we thank you. For the giving of your people, multiply and increase those who have given. 
those who haven't given, don't bless them. Help them understand that they are not poor. In Jesus' mighty name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest. Thank you.